Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Ashanti Golar, the president of Emerge. Thank you for joining us today for another exciting Leaders Matters virtual salon series. I'm going to give it a minute so we can have all of our participants gather because we want to make sure you hear the full conversation. While we're waiting, please feel free to use the chat so you can tell our special guest today where you're from. And of course, if you have any questions you would like to ask, please use the Q&A box. Oh, I can see we're already gonna have a really nice crowd for this conversation. That's Caroline Donahue from New York. She is one of our phenomenal board members. We love Caroline. Who else do we have? Use the chat. Let us know where you are from. Maryland, Pennsylvania. Of course, our amazing Bay Area supporters. Maine, North Dakota. South Carolina, Virginia. All right. We are going to have amazing representation today. Hello, everyone. If you're just joining, please feel free to use the chat to let us know where you are Zooming in from. And if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A box to submit your questions. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Hello, everyone. I'm Ashanti Golar. I am the president of Emerge and am very excited for today's Leaders Matter virtual salon series with two special guests. For those of you who are new to us, we started doing these series to really highlight the amazing leadership that comes out of the Democratic Party, not only from the amazing alums in our network, who have been at the front lines of everything from COVID to our racial injustice pandemic, but also to other amazing leaders in the Democratic Party who have been great supporters of women and Emerge. And we're going to be having a great conversation today with one of those supporters. This conversation is going to be moderated by one of our amazing Emerge alums, Lieutenant Governor Alini Kunalakis who we are so excited to have join us because we know she has a lot going on. So thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for taking the time and moderating this conversation with our special guest, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who I actually got to know when he was running for chair of the DNC and saw this amazing, dynamic guy just really out there with so many phenomenal ideas and like all of you, I got to watch his historic and groundbreaking presidential campaign, and I saw what it meant to so many people. So thank you, Mayor Pete, for <laughs> being a leader in our party and just all that you represent to so many people and to have the support of the Lieutenant Governor, who is the highest ranking elected official in California, <laughs> to support the mayor. So that lets you know he has some powerhouse people behind him, and he absolutely still does. And with that, I will turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor to start the conversation. Thank you so much, Ashanti. And thank you for your incredible leadership of Emerge. Uh, I uh, never get tired of recognizing Emerge as the most impactful organization for training and preparing women to run for office. It is remarkable how many women who have been through your program who are now sitting in elected office, and I'm proud to count myself among them as the first woman ever elected Lieutenant Governor of California. Uh, so thank you to everyone for joining this and for all of your support of Emerge. It is, again, in my mind, the most impactful way to get more women elected. Uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful treat today. We have uh, almost a full hour with Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And I know many of you have turned in because you supported him in his bid for the presidency. Uh, and uh, it's just wonderful to have him here. And we have a lot to talk about. So Mayor Pete, um, I have some questions that were pre-sourced from uh, our participants, but I wanna start with a few words 
of introduction. Mayor Pete is an American politician and Afghanistan war veteran. He served as the mayor of South Bend, Indiana from 2012 to 2020 and was a candidate for the Democratic nomination in the 2020 United States presidential election. Mayor Pete is a graduate of Harvard University and Oxford University where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. And from 2009 to 2017, he was an intelligence officer in the US Navy Reserve attaining the rank of Lieutenant. He was mobilized and deployed to Afghanistan for seven months in 2014. Mayor Pete was the 32nd mayor of South Bend, Indiana. And of course, he launched his campaign for the 2020 United States presidential election in 2019, becoming the first openly gay person to launch a major presidential campaign. Mayor Pete, narrowly won the pledge delegate count in the Iowa caucuses and tied the pledge delegate count in the New Hampshire primary. By earning the most delegates in Iowa, he became the first openly gay candidate to win a presidential primary or caucus, making so many of us proud. Mayor Pete ended his campaign on March 1st, 2020 and endorsed Joe Biden for president the following day. Besides his native English, Mayor Pete has fluency in seven additional languages, including Italian, Maltese, Spanish, Persian, Arabic, French, and Norwegian. I had to include that last line in your resume, Mayor Pete, uh, because it's so cool. And I wanna start as a point of privilege with a question of my own. You know, um, the reason that I supported you had a lot to do with your, uh, with your background and understanding of foreign policy. Uh, it also had to do with the fact that you were a veteran and the fact, frankly, that as a young candidate, you understand viscerally the way the technology is changing the world around us. But the reality is what compelled me and drove me to get involved in your presidential campaign was that friends of mine who had started, some of them I think are on this call in fact, uh, who had started and gotten involved with you in California very early, expressed a, a, an energy and a positivity uh, and a culture of a campaign that was inspirational and positive. And that's something in my own race that I tried very hard to do. But to do what you did on a national level was from my perspective, um, really extraordinary. And I thought um, because so many of us on this call are either involved in politics or aspiring to run, maybe you could start by talking about that incredible positive culture that you had in the Buttigieg campaign and any um, kind of reflections of how you built it and how we all can build that in our political engagement. Uh, well, thank you. First of all, it's, it's so great to be reunited with you and, and uh, your support during the campaign was, uh, was a great honor and uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled to have the occasion to, uh, to join you again. And I know that your leadership right now in California is so incredibly important. So uh, I'm delighted to have some time with you. And, and uh, I want to acknowledge and thank Ashanti and, and the team at Emerge. I'm, I'm such a believer in the work that you're doing and, and so glad that we could, uh, we could be together right now. And thanks, thanks for your question. I remember so well. Uh, our uh, first uh, early conversations that really revolved around this question of culture and how important it was to you, uh, is to you, and, and was as part of my campaign. One of the first things that we did was set out what we called the rules of the road, a set of values that uh, were intended to guide everybody who was part of the campaign, whether it was a staff member, whether it was a, a contributor or uh, even a volunteer knocking on doors. We called it the rules of the road and we wanted everybody to really think about these values. And they're different uh, from the political values that meant a lot to us around freedom, democracy and security and the values that guided my policy positions. This is a set of values about how we did business. We talked about the important, the very first one on the list was respect. Uh, we, we thought a lot about how to cultivate that sense of respect for the office, that we were seeking for our competitors, for everybody that we encountered, 
we really focused teamwork. Belonging was one of the biggest themes uh, of our campaign because we thought it would help us show and not just tell how a presidency that I hope to build would establish a sense of belonging for America at a time when that's so painful and difficult for us. And the last one that was certainly not the least out of the 10 uh, uh, values that, that we uh, always tried to hold ourselves to was joy, because that's such an important part. Uh, uh, you know, so much of politics has this spirit of grim determination, especially right now, because the stakes are so high. And yet there's always joy in, in coming together with people you, uh, you come to uh, learn to trust in the support of something you believe in. And we wanted to be in touch with that. Uh, so I really uh, value your, your kind of lifting up uh, that, that dimension of our campaign. And I do think it's something for uh, candidates and especially first time candidates to spend a lot of time in. It's, it's not in any of the manuals that, uh, you know, no consultant will ever say, you know, you gotta do fundraising, you gotta do a media plan and you gotta lay out your values on how to do business. It's not part of the playbook, but it was a very important part of ours. And it's especially uh, uh, vital, I think, because when you launch a campaign, you know, inevitably, you're, you're, you're going to have some people at your side who've been with you forever. And you're also going to place a huge amount of trust in some people you just met in a way that outside of the military, I, I, I've, I've never seen it happen in, in any other way than it does on the campaign trail. And so one of the best things you can do, and frankly, your responsibility as a candidate is not just to have the, the right policies or uh, sign off on the right game plan, but in my view, to establish that culture. In fact, the, the better a campaign is going, the more you can uh, let staff do uh, do what they're there to do and focus on things like uh, only making those decisions where questions of culture or, or values are at stake. Uh, and I think those kinds of disciplines re really serve us well uh, on the campaign. And I think it's uh, something worth considering uh, for any candidate at any level, because uh, often uh, people won't remember exactly how you answered a, a particular uh, a question about your plans as much as they'll remember uh, having a sense of, of what values will guide you in making these decisions. Uh, you know, I uh, think that is extraordinary. Rules of the road for a campaign and that two of them would be respect and joy. And if there are uh, any eMERGE um, trainees on the call right now, I encourage you to look up the rest of them. Uh, Mayor Pete, have you shared all of those rules of the road? Are, are they out there for people to read and, and, and examine even more closely? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, respect, uh, truth, belonging. That's like naming your, 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 if you had 10 kids, I'm worried a one will slip me, but uh, uh, teamwork, boldness, responsibility, substance, discipline, excellence, and joy. And each of them meant something very specific to us. I think there's, there's uh, it'll be uh, fairly easier to find if, if you look up uh, uh, Rules of the Road next to my name. They also guide my current organization, Win the Era, which is a, a PAC and a 501c4 uh, nonprofit that are uh, designed to really carry the values of our uh, organization forward and support other wonderful candidates. And uh, those same values, those same rules of the road are operative there. And folks can learn more about that at the uh, uh, Windy Arrow. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask okay. you to talk a little bit about that. But first, um, one of the questions that came through as we um, canvassed our participants before starting today had to do with the fact that uh, you're the first um, openly gay candidate to ever win a caucus uh, in a presidential race in our country. Can you talk a little bit about your journey, um, about uh, your personal process in, in running for mayor, coming out in 2015, um, and how you approached your campaign as, uh, uh, you know, with, in this world of identity politics and how you navigated both the challenges associated with it, but also, um, could serve as, as an inspiration for so many? Well, I, I think anytime you find yourself in a position where your win would, would represent something historic or even the campaign itself, um, and, and, as you have and, and so many have, you're weighing the balance between, on one hand, uh, making sure that you uh, live into the responsibilities that come with that and recognize the, the, the hope that that can bring to so many people and the, the extent to which, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, uh, whatever and whoever you represent will, will be uh, judged partly on, on what you do. And on the other hand, 
not to allow any one piece of your identity to consume uh, all of it, uh, to define you. Uh, when each of us is, is defined by a, a, an amazing combination of, 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 of identities and attributes and values and things that we care about. And so you know, our strategy, in many ways, it, it followed the approach that I took here in South Bend after I came out and Chaston came into my life and we were trying to figure out just how to go about being a couple. Uh, everything from, you know, how to behave at, at, you know, all the chicken dinners that a mayor goes to, uh, to what to do if we, we got media questions about our personal lives. And we quickly reached the conclusion that the best thing we could do uh, was to uh, act like any other couple and invite people to treat us the same. And in doing that, we're actually making a, a very intentional statement uh, about uh, uh, about some of the uh, things that made us not uh, like any other couple, certainly not like any other political couple that had been seen uh, in, in Mike Pence's Indiana at the time. Uh, what we found was that our story uh, allowed us to connect to people, even who were nothing like, like me, uh, people who were on different... Uh, uh, having different experiences in the struggle for belonging. And we're in different patterns of exclusion that maybe weren't the same or couldn't compare exactly to uh, what it meant to be the first uh, out LGBTQ elected official to run, um, but could allow us to tie some threads between our different experiences and most importantly, motivate one another to keep going. And some, you know, I, I never set out to be the, the gay president or the, the president of the gay United States, but uh, also never uh, never hid from, from uh, who I was in the course of this campaign and, and found that so many of the most moving moments uh, from uh, encounters with young people to uh, people my parents' age who never imagined this would even be possible. Uh, they all came because of that, that historic quality. You know, it's really interesting to hear you talk about this issue of identity um, because I, I think that um, we do tend to um, be informed by our identity, myself as a woman, you know, that, that piece of us, as you say, but this broader idea that who we are is defined by so many different attributes. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? And in particular, you had this one very interesting interaction with Pence um, around faith and religion. Um, and if you could give us a little more insight and maybe share for everyone what you said. Yeah, I mean, part, part of what shaped me uh, is also my, my faith experience. And, and it was very important to me never to uh, uh, stray from the importance of the separation of church and state in this country, to make clear that my candidacy and my presidency were for people of every religion and, and no religion equally. But I also thought it was appropriate to explain how I'd been formed. And, and uh, you know, my faith tradition teaches that uh, salvation has a lot to do with uh, how you look after the marginalized and the oppressed. And we have a responsibility uh, to, to care for the least of these. And I, I, that has a lot of moral implications that affect how I come up policy questions. And I'd seen the way, and of course, anyone in, in, in the, uh, the queer community lives uh, the ways that faith can be used as a cudgel, as a tool of exclusion, and thought it was very important to assert that, uh, uh, that there was a different way to think about faith in public life. And uh, uh, so I, I let the vice president know that I, I felt his quarrel was with my creator. And uh, uh, I, I seemed to have hit a nerve because he, uh, he responded more than he usually does. And, uh, I, I always hold out the hope that you can reach somebody, although I don't uh, think that I've ever quite been able to get through to the vice president the way that uh, you would hope to get through to another human being with a message of compassion and inclusion. It, it was a remarkable, it was a remarkable thing you did. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that that uh, interaction probably did more um, to help people uh, across this country kind of connect uh, the experiences of their personal life, everybody, um, you know, the overwhelming support in the country for um, LGBTQ marriage, same-sex marriage, all of that that happened and helped to uh, really address something that hadn't been addressed so elegantly. So I just want to note that. The other um, series of questions that came up that people are curious about is your age. You were one of the youngest candidates to have ever run for president. Why do you think it's important for young people to continue to step up 
and run for office? And what advice would you give to young candidates running at all hmm. levels? Yeah. Of so, uh, I mean, first of all, like uh, uh, the importance of making sure that we uh, elect uh, more excellent women uh, to office and, and, and the importance of having more LGBTQ candidates and, and uh, in so many other areas, uh, building up a generation of black leadership and, and in so many ways, it's about representation. Uh, and uh, uh, age is, is different. It's, it's the one identity trait that, uh, uh, that definitely changes uh, for each of us. I mean, already I find myself uh, uh, it, uh, twitching just a little bit when I have to use the words your generation talking about some of the youngest candidates that, that we work with. Uh, but of course, it's, it's inevitable in the way of the world. But I'm 38 years old. And the last time I checked, that is the median age of the United States. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what, what's clear is that uh, uh, the American people are not represented in a proportional way. Uh, generational. And it, this is happening also at a moment when uh, our country is, is uh, making a lot of decisions, facing a lot of decisions that will disproportionately affect younger generations. Uh, the most glaring example of this, of course, is climate. But so many of the decisions, including just the, the uh, more seemingly short-term choices about how we're going to emerge from this pandemic, I think are nothing less than the the pattern being decided right, right in these next few months and a couple of years of how the social and the political and economic arrangements of our country are gonna look for the rest of our lifetimes. And this has huge consequences uh, from the perspective of, of generational justice and opportunities for, uh, for those who are uh, uh, in many cases not even old enough to vote, yet alone, let alone run for office. And so I think the stakes are so high for that younger generation. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, mine right now is on track to be the first generation to be worse off economically than our parents, if nothing changes. Um, but our generation also has already made such impact on the world. And uh, each young generation is the most uh, racially diverse yet in American history, which helps us get a glimpse of what our future is going to look like, too. So for all of these reasons, uh, I think it was an important and positive part of our campaign, um, and, and one that was not exclusionary of anybody. In fact, one of the things I loved was that often it was older voters who were most responsive to the idea of a younger candidate. And that's the first piece of advice I want to give to young candidates is don't assume uh, that uh, uh, you you will uh, only have appeal to other uh, younger voters. Sometimes the opposite is even the case. Uh, and uh, you, you should uh, explore that and, and lean in. Another is not to wait your turn, not to wait for anybody to tell you that, uh, uh, that you've now become old enough uh, to run. And, uh, you know, a, a third is to really connect up the, the personal lived experience of the new generation with the stakes of the choices that are being made, because I think there's a moral authority. Uh, and again, I'm thinking about uh, activism among people even not yet old enough to vote sometimes. The, the, the world's most prominent climate activist is a Swedish teenager who I think to this day would not yet be old enough to vote if she were an American citizen. The March for Our Lives changed the conversation on gun violence. So much of the leadership in the movement for black lives uh, is coming from a, a younger generation. There's such power in uh, young people speaking up and, and asking those who are in a position of uh, authority or control, what are you doing to make uh, me keep me safe? Uh, and uh, I hope that more young candidates step up and recognize the power of that voice. And I think we bring a tremendous amount to the public square. So true. So great. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that are coming through uh, the uh, from from people watching right now. Um, but before, and I encourage everybody to get your questions in through the chat function is how we're doing it. So um, go ahead. If you have a question for Mayor Pete, please um, write it in the chat box. Someone is monitoring that and then sending them to me to ask Mayor Pete. So before we get to the questions that have just come in, I do want to ask you uh, the question that, of course, on everybody's mind, what are you doing now? Uh, what have you been doing since, uh, the, uh, since your campaign and talk, if you would, a little bit about Win the Era. Well, thank you. Uh, so uh, I found, as I think so many of us have, just how um, uh, quickly you can get very busy even when you're not leaving the four walls uh, of, of home. And uh, so uh, what, what I found is that, you know, the very same things that motivated me to run 
uh, are at stake right now. And I can best serve those same things that motivated me to get into the presidential race in other ways. One of them, of course, is to do everything in my power to support Joe Biden and make sure he's our next president. But uh, I also think, and I know that, that uh, Emerge is, is way ahead of the curve on this and folks on this call are all over this fact. We can't treat the presidency like the only office that matters. And it's so important to be supporting, uh, not only to make sure that the next president has a great Senate and Congress to work with, but to recognize in our American system, how much power there is in state and local office. I don't only think of state and local office as important because they're, they're the so-called bench. Uh, it's certainly true that many people who will go on to federal office uh, work in, in those areas too. But I think sometimes that metaphor misses the point, which is that there's so much power in those offices, especially in a moment like this where in the context of the pandemic and in the context of the national uh, outpouring of, uh, of anguish over justice and policing, these decisions are almost always made much closer to the local level and in the state uh, level. So all of this makes it, uh, to me, very personally important that my campaign be there, as well as supporting uh, candidates who, who represent a newer generation, supporting women, supporting candidates of color, uh, out candidates uh, uh, who would benefit from the same kind of support that I got. And that's the idea of the new era. We're not, uh, uh, we're not a comprehensive or, or massive organization uh, uh, that, that's uh, uh, involved across the board. But what we've done is we've, we've selected a number of candidates that we're backing, who I think collectively tell a story. Uh, about the kinds of uh, offices we should be paying attention to, everywhere from county supervisor to the U.S. Senate. Uh, and you can learn more at windyera.com. Uh, we also have the 501c4, Win the Era Action Fund. And I think it's really important right now for us to be dealing with issues uh, that are sometimes uh, not as sizzling or, 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 or sexy uh, uh, as other topics in the day, like democratic reform, process, just the mechanics of how our elections are run so important as are issues from mental health and belonging uh, to national service and building social trust that were a very important part of my campaign and, and, and a very important part of, uh, of what we're working on uh, right now. So uh, those are some of the things that keep me busy uh, out in the Zumo sphere every day. I know there's some folks even, even on this call who've been so uh, wonderful about uh, uh, showing up for these candidates and causes that, that we're backing and teaming up and looking for great organizations to work with from Fair Fight uh, which is doing such fantastic work pushing back on voter suppression, to an organization like Emerge uh, that has trained now thousands uh, of, uh, of women and is, uh, has played a role in, in hundreds of them uh, reaching office. This is what it's going to take for our country to be a better place. And we call it win the era because I don't think this is just about winning an election. Uh, I think that the decade in front of us right now, the decade that's just beginning this year, will be remembered as the decisive decade for how the rest of this century goes, for America's life at home and uh, standing around the world. Uh, so we don't have a moment to lose. I'm, I'm still a little regretful of that beach vacation we thought we were gonna take uh, in March right after the uh, uh, campaign came to a close, but uh, uh, that'll have to wait because we've got, uh, we got a lot of work to do. So great. So um, not surprisingly, our first question comes from a recent Emerge graduate currently running her first campaign. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Madera. She recently graduated from Emerge Tennessee. And she asks, I decided to run for office against an 18 year Republican candidate in the Tennessee State House. And I am impressed by the way Mayor Pete, quote, spoke progressive in a conservative state. Does he have any advice on staying true to yourself and your values while also having a message that reaches conservative voters? Yes, it's so important. I'm so glad that, that, uh, uh, that you're stepping up to run uh, in uh, uh, a more conservative state like Tennessee. And I'm right there with you being here in Indiana. My congressional district is a Trump plus 23 district. And yet, what, one of the things we saw in the campaign was that, especially in Iowa, uh, our win was largely attributable to uh, voters in counties that had gone from uh, voting for Barack Obama to Donald Trump, uh, and now uh, we're ready to flip again. Um, I think, let me start by sharing a few things I don't think are the way to do it. Uh, you know, first of all, I don't think you ever get anywhere by, by uh, uh, tricking people, although sometimes uh, you'll be advised to do that. You should be straightforward about what you um, and uh, also that it doesn't require watering down your values or pretending to be something that you're not. But I think it's largely a question of vocabulary. And I think sometimes speaking in terms of values before you talk about policies helps you earn the level of trust that lets people hear you. 
you know, time and time again, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, be at a campaign event, I'd do my thing. People would come up to me afterward and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican, have been for years, but I want to support you. And part of me would think, well, did you see the speech? Because uh, I was pretty, pretty clear about some progressive positions and values. But it was a sense that we were talking from, from a place of, of belief in what America could be and, and how values that have been talked about as if they were only on the conservative side, like freedom, like security, uh, are actually values that I think, and, and even faith in, in, in my case, um, that, that point much more in the direction of the things we were talking about. I think there's a historic opportunity for a realignment right now, too, because the Republican Party's uh, leader and Donald Trump is somebody whose behavior and, and life and and actions are, I think, as offensive to conservative values as they are to liberal and progressive values. And so uh, there's a way that this can shake loose more than usual. Uh, and, and we should do everything we can to, to respond to that. Um, the last thing I would mention I think is important that we overlook sometimes is just uh, a level of respect for where people are coming from. And again, this, isn't, this doesn't require backing away from your beliefs at all. Uh, but we should think about what you would want to see in order to feel welcome if you were ever in the situation of, of walking away from a Republican Party where maybe you had been for your entire life. You know, wagging our finger at people and telling them they, how foolishly they've been voting against their self-interests or uh, informing them that they were complicit in a crime by the way they voted last time is not going to help them open up their hearts and minds to what we have to say. Um, but if we can acknowledge where they're coming from and above all, make them feel welcome in this movement that we're building and even name the fact that we won't agree on everything because people uh, will uh, not always demand that their elected representatives agree with them in every particular. Uh, take those steps. and It's remarkable uh, how many people will come across, especially at a time like this. So the next question comes from Susan Pfeiffer. Susan uh, is probably the best known organizer in San Francisco, and she was very active in your campaign, as I know you remember. Uh, she is now fighting every day to help get Joe Biden elected. And she asks, what have you been relaying to the Biden campaign about the issues that you're most passionate about? Well, first of all, Susan, thanks so much for, for your support for our effort and, and for everything you're doing to make sure that we retake the White House. Uh, and I've uh, really been uh, uh, so heartened by the, uh, the outreach from the Biden campaign and, and everything from uh, bringing on some of our phenomenal alumni from Pete for America uh, to uh, making sure that uh, uh, some of the in tactical insights from our, our campaign, things we learned about well, digital campaigning, for example, are taken on board. And on the policy front, uh, inviting, uh, for example, our uh, policy director, Sonal Shah, to be uh, on that uh, crucially important committee uh, that brought together uh, different camps for, for the unity uh, effort in, in, in building and formulating an economic policy for the future. You know, to me, the, the most important things are that we link up every policy idea to a broader set of values and that we do it with a view to the future. And just think about the things that are going to be on the president's desk on day one. Uh, and none of them can wait. Climate can't wait. Uh, racial justice can't wait. Uh, reforming our democracy can't wait. And all of these things need to be uh, connected. Uh, I think uh, uh, wisely, for example, the way that uh, he's been uh, talking about what has to happen with climate change has been directly connected to an economic message. I think that's uh, exactly the kind of conversation we need to have. First of all, because it's the right thing to do on the merits, uh, but also it helps us flip the script a little bit on this uh, presumption that doing the right thing for the environment uh, is, is somehow uh, wrong for the economy, uh, which, by the way, uh, is kind of parallel to what's going on in the public health situation, where we're seeing in a very cruel way, we're being reminded that there is no fixing the economy until you deal with the virus. Uh, so, you know, these are uh, obviously there, there are a range of, of uh, voices that are contributing their, their insights, and I'm honored to be among them. Uh, I also have a lot of trust that the vice president and the team that, that he's built. Uh, will uh, not miss an opportunity to uh, call in a lot of voices into the new administration that will help guide uh, uh, this, uh, this country in that moment. And that he will be the, the transformational and transitional figure that he's often said he thinks of himself as being uh, when it comes to what his presidency will be like. Wise words. Um, the next question <laughs> from Alex Smith. And I think this is a really important question. It's something we've been hearing a lot about in the media, and that's the issue of voter suppression. You ran a national campaign. You're from uh, the Midwest. You know 
um, some of the dynamics in the battleground states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. What do you foresee um, in these battleground states where every vote will count? Um, how do you see voter suppression playing out? How do you see um, long lines at the polls, other uh, kinds of potential interference, um, the announcement that Trump is going to have poll watchers. Uh, how do you look at these battleground states and are you as concerned as so many about the issue of voter suppression? And in particular, Alice wants to know relative to young people. Um, can yeah. you talk a little bit about this, how you see it playing out, what you're most concerned about, and most importantly, what the Democrats need to do to make sure that every vote is counted? Because what we know is that when everybody votes, Democrats win. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the truth is only one party has adopted a strategy of making it harder for voters uh, supporting the other party to vote at all. And uh, the consequences of that have been stark. They are real. And in many ways, I think they are worsening. Uh, widespread voter suppression in all kinds of forms, from purges to disenfranchisement by typo because of these strict match requirements to voter ID laws, uh, which unfortunately were pioneered here in, in my state of Indiana, uh, to uh, the kinds of things that might happen to polling sites themselves in terms of intimidation, uh, are, are all an enormous concern. Good news is there are wonderful organizations working on this. I mentioned earlier Fair Fight. Uh, there are uh, many other uh, efforts to uh, the, uh, Mark Elias and, and uh, a, a phenomenal legal team uh, are working uh, state by state to challenge uh, all kinds of measures that uh, have the effect uh, of voter suppression. Uh, and we need to be really vigilant about this and call it out. In addition to the nefarious uh, uh, voter suppression, Oh, and let me mention one other thing about these patterns, because I, I think Alice's question is wise. Uh, you know, it has systematically targeted voters of color. There's no question of that. Less talked about is the fact that it also has systematically impacted uh, younger voters. In fact, just about every time that there's a decision, I think it was the, the Brennan Center uh, leadership pointed this out, where uh, uh, some decision in the, uh, in the law could either tip this way or tip that way. It always happens to tip in a way that is likely to make it harder for voters of color to vote and harder for younger voters to vote. I mean, the fact that in some states you can have no fault absentee voting, mail, vote by mail, but you gotta be over 65 to do it. Just one simple example uh, of uh, why this is, uh, this is a real challenge. Now, on top of that, we have something that's not as not nefarious in intent, but just as big of a problem, which is a simple lack of poll workers. Look, we wanna make sure vote by mail is accessible to as many people as possible. And if it was good enough for the president, it was good enough for me when I was in Afghanistan, it's good enough for every American. But we also know that in states that haven't had a long uh, tradition of vote by mail, it's gonna be very important to have safe in-person voting available too. For that to happen, there have to be poll workers. Now this is not something that I think folks in, in uh, our generation really think about much. It's, uh, but, but if you do think about it, in our country, for better or for worse, most elections are run on a day-to-day -day level by retirees volunteering as poll workers. Now it's not, it's something you do not as a Democrat, but as an American. But we need more people in the environment of COVID when so many retirees will not be in a position to do that. We need more people to step up and volunteer to do that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, you see these shocking reductions in the number of polling sites available. Uh, Milwaukee was especially disturbing. I think it went from 175 last time around to six this time. Uh, and again, in a way that disadvantaged black voters in particular. The third thing I want to mention, and this is a little bit uh, kind of in the other direction, but it's worth mentioning. Not only do we need to make sure everybody's registered to vote, that we're heading off any kind of voter suppression and, and that we're sounding the alarm and there's a problem on the front end. On the back end, we need to defend legitimate election results. Look, this president's either going to win or he's going to say there was cheating. One of those two things is going to happen. And so when we win, we've got to make sure, uh, first of all, I hope that we make sure it's not even close. But also in this and other elections, we've got to make sure that people don't uh, get caught in a narrative that undermines democracy itself. And, uh, you know, from our experience in Iowa, I, I know how frustrating it is when you don't get the results on the day of. But I'll also say we need to be prepared as Americans not to get many important election results on election night on that Tuesday in November. And that actually might be a good sign. That might be a sign that people are uh, doing their job, carefully counting mail-in votes, which sometimes they're not allowed to touch until after the polls close. But it will mean a very tense 
potentially a few days where we don't have all the results in a lot of the key battleground areas. Pennsylvania is one example of a state that has these requirements on how the uh, mail-in ballots are handled. And uh, we've got to head off any of the efforts to undercut the election itself. Mayor Pete, um, I know we can all listen to you talk forever, but um, I have four more questions. Ooh, all right, I'm, I'll be concise. I'm gonna take the two first um, from, from women who are running for office right now. So Hyatt Lytle, who is running uh, for mayor of Corvallis. She's an Oregon city councilor right now running for mayor. And she asks, uh, how are you applying your experience in local politics to the racial injustices that we are facing right now? Such an important question. Yes, and, and Hyde, you're on your way to the best and hardest job in, in, uh, in the world, I think, uh, that, that of being a mayor at a time when it matters so much. Look, the, the truth is a lot of these questions of racial justice uh, are ones that play out in local decision making. We all know the need for a, a presidency in a federal government that's more attentive on everything from dealing with police violence uh, to making sure that we have greater economic empowerment of black Americans. But whatever's going on federally, so many of these are backyard decisions. And it will be very important for local leaders uh, to establish processes for police accountability. This is a huge struggle the entire time that I was mayor. And every time we gained ground in one area of transparency, there was a challenge uh, in another. And it only gets better if there are ways to empower uh, individual community residents uh, to have authority over those who uh, serve in those communities as, as police. And finding those models is one of the most important things that local government can do. The most boring seeming decisions around something like zoning may have tremendous implications for issues and questions like uh, access to capital and wealth building for black families and residents. I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to do uh, a round of research on how uh, racial income and wealth gaps uh, apply specifically in your area. Ours, uh, we, we called it in uh, a round of research from a group called Prosperity Now and applied it here in South Bend, knowing that the numbers would be uh, really disturbing, but also knowing that we needed that, that data in order to have the right kind of community conversation. So uh, the questions of systemic racism and, and, and uh, institutional racial bias uh, need to be worked at every level. And often I think it's actually in the local space that you can get uh, sometimes the, the most traction. Uh, nobody can be uh, on the sidelines of this. And frankly, it will be especially important to challenge often progressive white communities and neighborhoods uh, to be part of the solution. Uh, I think we, we need to think a little more about uh, the ways in which uh, many, uh, again, notionally liberal uh, white Americans uh, who would never uh, uh, consciously uh, do anything that would promote racial inequity, nevertheless, uh, are in many ways just by virtue of the system that we are either dismantling or we're reproducing. It's only one or the other. Uh, need to look harder. And again, this is taken everything from uh, neighborhood building uh, codes and economic expectations uh, to uh, some of the assumptions that go into public safety, policing, education, health, and once again, voting itself, which is one of the most important spaces uh, where today's questions of racial justice are at stake. Mary Barthelson, she is a candidate in Virginia running against an incumbent. Mm -hmm. She has a technical question. I think it is so mm -hmm. important and during my eMERGE training. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that constantly came up because of how challenging it is. She wants to know if you have any advice to new candidates on how to establish themselves and how to fundraise, particularly during this difficult time where there's mm. a lack of person-to-person -person engagement. Yeah, look, it's it's tough getting used to this, right? I mean, politics is about gathering people in, in person. It's the bread and butter of what we do. And yet, in, in many ways, we've found that so much of what we do can happen in other ways too. Uh, you know, fundraising uh, is something we can do by Zoom. It's something that, that we've always done over the phone. Uh, and the most important thing is that real life relationships drive whatever we do uh, in the virtual space. Uh, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, changes in, in the way campaigning has worked have happened from time to time, just never this swiftly. 
And we've got to adapt every dimension of, of how candidates uh, and campaigning works. Uh, but it's not the first time we've had to. I mean, 100 years ago, it was considered rude for a candidate to campaign for themselves, right? William McKinley running for president, he had to go to his porch if you wanted to see him speak. Um, it's just that usually those things evolve a few decades at a time, not overnight like we have now. We're all figuring it out. Um, but there's so many wonderful resources, organizations, efforts like Emerge to help make sure that the tech side uh, can be supported. And uh, again, I think the most important thing is those individual relationships. On the question of establishing yourself, I would mention one other just simple thing that I think is especially helpful or important running for uh, uh, office in, in uh, state and local contests. I would make a list of everybody you can think of who ought to be consulted and everybody who might think they ought to be consulted and talk to them one by one. And at the end of each conversation, uh, and, and the, the more listening you're doing, the better. I've had some wonderful meetings when I was trying to, first getting started as a candidate, uh, it would come back to me that, that somebody felt that uh, they'd been really impressed with this meeting they had with me. And I would think back and I think I barely said a thing in that meeting, just listening is so important. Uh, and, and uh, helps people come, I think, to trust you. Um, but then at the end, ask for the names of three people that they think you ought to talk to. And when you finally get to the point where it's almost always people you've already spoken with, that's how you know that you've kind of mapped the whole kind of human space. And even in a place where you've lived your entire life, you'd be amazed how many uh, uh, pockets of uh, social circles or, or neighborhood or uh, religious or racial or ethnic uh, uh, groups, you, you just don't quite uh, touch if you don't really go out of your way to make sure you find anybody. And the good news about that, even though, look, it, we know it's not the same, but the good news about that is you can do that from anywhere uh, just by picking up the phone. I love that. Um, you know, it's rare that you get that level of practicality in the steps. Make a list of the people who are important and then ask each one of them when you call them, uh, who else they think is important. That's a roadmap. That is extremely helpful. And Mary, if I can just add my two cents to this, um, you know, Mayor Pete was mayor of Indiana. He stood up and he ran for a DNC chair and people said, who is this guy to run? Then he stood up and ran for president and people said, who is he to run? I had never run for public office before and I ran for Lieutenant Governor of California. People say, who is she to run? When you know that you have something to offer and you go through those steps and you can convince those people who you talk to one at a time that you have something to offer, it builds up um, a basis of support that then um, can take on a life of its own. But I don't think there's any better example of what is possible if you work hard and follow the guidelines that uh, Mayor Pete has just outlined than his own campaign, which will truly go down as one of the most remarkable presidential campaigns uh, ever. So we have another question, and I'd like you to go ahead and um, uh, expand on this because I think it's something that uh, all of us in our personal or in our, um, even in our professional lives are talking about. And that is the division that has been sowed in this country since the 2016 election. The level of um, hurtfulness in public discourse, the uh, level of hurtfulness as a practical matter to people being able to access healthcare and aid, uh, the fear generated by um, saber rattling against China and the fear generated by uh, Donald Trump and the uh, unwillingness to uh, tell people they should wear a mask and, and uh, to take the necessary precautions around COVID. Um, there is so much uh, going on right now that is, that is tearing people apart and isolating people from one another. Mayor Pete, um, give us a vision for the future of bringing Americans back together again. Well, let me mention just a couple of things. Uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this. In fact, I've been writing about this. I'll, I'll have a book uh, coming out uh, a little bit before the election on the subject of trust and, and with a couple of ideas on uh, how social trust can be built up. 
Um, I would start by encouraging you to think about somebody, and this may be easier for us in some parts of the country than others, but just about all of us can do it. Somebody you really like, appreciate, enjoy, who's you also just think is as a human being, but 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 you also just think is in totally the wrong and maybe even frightening place politically. And just think about what you appreciate about them as a human. There's this thread of humanity that we need to be able to grasp in order to pull this country back together. And uh, part of it is being ready to reach out, again, not in a way that ever waters down or compromises what we believe in, but in a way that recognizes that this country consists of people and it consists of people who are capable of good and bad things and do both every day, as we all do, because we're human. And that we have an opportunity, especially when you have the, the public visibility that comes, by the way, not just for winning office, but just for running for it. Uh, just, just as a candidate, you've got a, an amazing platform and a media reach that, that, uh, uh, that really means something. And use it to remind at every turn people what the most uh, essential values are that we rely on as a country in order to move ahead. And those values should cut across all of the noise, all of the fear mongering, all the division and the chaos. And we need to be able to use those as a touchstone uh, that that we can, especially when we're arguing, that we're at least arguing uh, over which ideas have the most fidelity to those values that we can all agree we share. And that's gonna be more important than ever. But candidly, uh, even though I believe in reaching across the aisle and, and working in nonpartisan pragmatic ways to get things done, the simple fact is we also need to win. We need leaders who actually believe in this, who would never allow a governing strategy to emerge that's about dividing people or suppressing their votes. We need eventually the Republicans to do this too, but I, I think they'll only get there if they experience a loss of power in this uh, election cycle that teaches the very same people who felt politically that they had no choice but to get on board with some of this stuff, uh, that in fact, uh, they will not be rewarded, uh, but quite the reverse for getting on board with this stuff. Um, but that's for the other party to figure out. What we've got to do in our party is make sure that we have a message that everyone can see that they belong in, even if they're in the ranks of what I always love to call the future former Republicans, uh, that we reach everybody with that message and that we just do the work. And, and that's, again, why I'm, I'm, I'm glad to team up with Emerge and, and, and inspired by so many phenomenal women uh, running to, to lead. Um, because, uh, you know, each of you can be part of the answer to that question and, and the solution to that problem. And uh, by stepping up to run, uh, you've already done a lot of that work. This has just been such an incredible conversation. I, I'm sure for people watching, but even honestly, Mayor Pete, just for me, uh, it's always so inspiring to be with you and to hear you, um, you know, talk about your experiences and your vision and give the kind of advice that you have uh, to um, not just LGBTQ, not just women, it really anyone who's ever felt marginalized in any way. And let's face it, I think that's most of us. Uh, and the power of coming together around a vision of a positive future is so uh, compelling and more important than ever. And I am sure uh, that your leadership is going to be uh, important in our country for decades to come. And uh, I, for one, uh, look forward to mm. being there and being part of, of your extraordinary leadership and, and just want to thank you for your commitment to foreign service, uh, public service, foreign service, uh, commitment to our country and just thank you and your family uh, for everything that you do every day to fight for a better, stronger America. Ashanti, uh, actually, Mayor Pete, any final words and then we'll hand it back over to Ashanti. Well, I just want to thank you again for, for your leadership, for your encouragement. Uh, I love that we're teaming up again today for Emerge and, and look forward to more opportunities to work together. And to Ashanti and, and the team, uh, I'm uh, such a big fan and to uh, all of the women who participated in this programming who are running uh, or thinking about running. Uh, you, you are the solution to so many of the problems we've been talking about. And uh, I'll be excited uh, to, to support you in various ways and, and to benefit from you 
your leadership that our country does in the years ahead. I know it's it's bleak right now. It's it's rough going. It's it's as high stakes as it could possibly be. But I still believe we're going to look back on this year as the beginning of the decade, the decisive decade that actually turned our country in a better direction than we've ever seen. And you're at the forefront of that. So I'm honored to be with you. And I look forward to us having a lot to celebrate come November if we get this right. Yes, thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Lenny Kunalakis, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Such an inspiring conversation. I really enjoyed it. I hope all of you did too. I saw the chat was very active. So lots of people agreeing with what you were saying, Mayor Pete. We appreciate both of you taking your time to have this discussion with us. I want to thank all of you for joining, especially our Leadership Circle members. Those are our supporters who give us $1,000 or more a year. We appreciate all of your support. And I always like to say you can always go to our website to continue to make contributions throughout the year. I also want to thank all of our sponsors of the Leaders Matters Virtual Salon Series, at Blue, Plant Parenthood, Ask Me, and UFCW. Everyone stay tuned to your emails because we will be having more of these series throughout the rest of the year with just wonderful leaders like you heard today. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <music>